So as electrical engineers, when you come upon this world of wearable sensors, you're drawn to the technology of it. You want to see how it works, you want to use it, you want to build little radios that will move the data around in real time, you want to visualize the data. And I've been doing that for about six years now. But then there came a time when someone asked me to share my experiences. So I laid out all this data, and I was staring at it, drowning in it, trying to figure out what's the real story here. And I think for me, the answer was to look inside the human body. We spend so much time building sensors that we think of as external to the body. But when you look inside the human body, you come upon something rather remarkable. As an electrical engineer, there's a certain sense of discovery that I experience when I recognized that the body has a sensor network. It didn't wait for technologists to come along to tell you what's happening inside your body. The vagus nerve innervates pretty much everything significant that you have in your body, either directly or through other cascading mechanisms. And it's able to sense there are chemoreceptors, there are baroreceptors to measure pressure, uh, there are stretch receptors, proprioceptors that tell you whether you're standing erect or you're about to tip over. There are pain sensors that can report pain from inside the body. So your body has been hard at work on an evolutionary time scale to monitor you. And wouldn't it be nice if you learned to listen to what your body is already set up to do? So how does it react? So there is the sensing part, and then there is the effect efferent direction. So it turns out that pretty much every organ is innervated by two sides of the so-called autonomic nervous system. Uh, on the right is the parasympathetic side, and on the left, in this illustration, is the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system side is what makes you get up and go, get up and run, fight or flight, accelerate things. The parasympathetic side is what puts the brakes on. Right? And the way the body is adapted, you have both of these things acting together at the same time so that you can respond in an appropriate way. And if you're not healthy, you respond in an inappropriate way. So while you could sense this in a lot of different ways, it turns out that perhaps the best way to sense this is through the heart. Why? Because the heart puts out an electrical signal. That's very easy to measure. So if you look a little bit more closely at the heart, you can actually find, these are anatomically correct drawings, I believe, I didn't make this up. Uh, you see these nerves that innervate the heart all over that are there to crank it up. And you see the vagus nerve come down to put the brakes on. If you were to cut the vagus nerve, the heart would beat at about 100 beats per minute. That's not a healthy heart, right? It's the vagus nerve that puts the brakes on and makes you relax. If you look at the waveform, that the composite waveform that you can measure, you get this characteristic uh, signature pattern. The highest peak there is called the R peak, R. It corresponds to the contractions of the left ventricle. It's the most powerful contraction that squirts the blood all over the body. If you look at the intervals from one R peak to the next, what you get is a time series. It's actually a random process. If I were to ask you, I've tried this on a number of people, I'm not going to do this in real time. If you ask yourself, do you think a regular heart is healthy or a somewhat irregular heart is a sign of health? Almost everybody thinks that a regular heart is a healthy heart. It's exactly the opposite. If you watch a tennis player waiting to receive a serve, what stance do they take? Are they standing rigidly or are they gently moving around? They're usually moving around, ready to spring in whatever direction they need to go, right? So you can study this more precisely. Uh, I don't mean to have you uh, look at all these figures uh, and explanations carefully, but what you see in those three plots on the x-axis are the age of an individual on whom these tests were done. 24-hour recordings were made, and it starts out at about the age of 10 and maxes out at the age of about 100. And what is plotted is measures of the variability of the heart, not the heart rate, the variability of the heart rate. And you notice that all these dots that correspond to different individuals trend downwards, right? What does that say? The older you get, the less variability your heart waveform produces. And when you go below a certain line, there's a dotted line there, if you can spot it, 
you're in trouble. You need to go to the emergency room. Down at the bottom is an interesting curve. It's got a very technical, nerdy name. It's called PNN50. What does that stand for? If you look at interbeat intervals, this comes from the medical literature. I didn't make any of this up. If you look at the interbeat intervals and you count the ones that deviate from the previous one by more than 50 milliseconds, then you say an NN50 event has occurred. Right? It's a measure of how your heart is accelerating and decelerating. You figure that out as a percentage, and that's what you plot. And it's an interesting nonlinear curve. There are equations that have been written. And so you could measure your heart rate variability and translate that into your heart age. That's actually a lot more motivating than just a number that tells you what it is. What we are trying to measure here is how your heart dances. The dance of the heart, not so much the dance of the body. So what do you do about it? As an engineer, you don't just want to study stuff. You want to understand how to turn the knobs. What knobs are there that will help you increase your vagal tone, which is another way of tracking the intensity of your parasympathetic nervous system? Well, this is a study that shows uh, how these things vary as a function of two very interesting things that come from cognitive sciences. Uh, first of all, you notice there are four lines. They all move up, right? So the y-axis is the vagal tone, all right? The figure on the left, the x-axis is social connectedness. And what it says is that the more socially connected you are, the greater your vagal tone will be. The picture on the right tracks on the x-axis positive emotions, okay? How many positive emotions do you experience in a day? If you experience more of it, your vagal tone goes up. Today, how do we measure our social connectedness? Facebook, how many friends do you have? How do you quantify positive emotions? How many like buttons did somebody hit when you posted something? It actually produces a little micro dopamine burst when you post something and people say like, right? I think this is the secret of Facebook. It drives up your vagal tone. Now, there's a dotted line at the bottom and a solid line on top, on, in both the curves. The dotted line are for people who are actually not having a high enough vagal tone to begin with. They get better with time. They get better as they get more socially connected and as they experience more so emotion, positive emotions. But the ones that have a vagal tone, a high vagal tone to begin with, really shoot up, right? So this, the, there are some cues here on how you might re-engineer your parasympathetic nervous system. By the way, so today we talk about Facebook, but what was it 2,000 years ago? The concept of satsang triggers exactly this. You gather together with others and you share experiences and thoughts that produce this sense of positivity, right? So that was the exercise that made sense back in the day. You know, it's an interesting thing when you look at all these devices that are available today, there are so many devices that measure how you arouse yourself. How many steps did you take? High, high, how high was your heart rate? I couldn't find one device that tells you how well you've activated your relaxation response. How do you quantify the intensity of your vagal tone? How do you learn something that you can build a new habit around? So we came up with something. This is not ready for launch by any sense. It's a prototype device that we built, and we, all we do is write proposals and papers based on it. So we called it the bliss buzzer. What it does is it tracks these moments. It's all programmable, so you can track whatever moments you feel like. But a good one to track was these NN50 events. You count the number of NN50 events in a day. Just like you count the number of steps you took in a day, you count the number of dance steps your heart took in a day. A few years ago, there was a company called the WIMM, W-I-M-M, -M, right? It went into stealth mode, Google bought it up, and I have to say I'm really disappointed at all the variable platforms that are coming out today because none of them has the computing capability that the WIMM had. They're all sexy-looking devices, great displays, but they're notification devices. That's all they do. Right? This old whim, which we can't buy any more of, was an Android platform. You could write a program and run a program on it, and you could make it buzz every time an NN50 event occurred. So it would annotate the moments of your life as it evolved. So what are some experiments I did? I listened to some music wearing these devices, and I was astonished. 
that there are these very significant changes in how my body responds. The curves that you see on the right-hand side, you know, metaphorically, think of your body as having a lot of musicians. The heart is playing a certain rhythm. Your lungs are playing a different rhythm. The pulsations of the blood that run through your circulation system has another rhythm. And they all bang away their instruments. But occasionally, you do something that puts them all in synchrony. That's what you see. That turned me on. I said, you know, there is something special going on. So I said, let me give this a shot in a larger gathering. So I went for a meditation, meditation session in the Kundalini tradition. There were 500 of us, kind of like this gathering, and we meditated, and there's the curve that this meditation produced. It was 30 minutes of chanting Om Namo Gurudev Namo with your hand on your navel, looking, gazing into the eyes of your partner who's sitting two feet away. You know, how many of us have gazed at our partner's eyes for 60 seconds? Right? You, when you do that for 30 minutes, it takes you into a different state. That's the experience, but you look at the data. So this practice is very arduous. Seven hours of it, twice a year. And again, I don't want to get you to read these numbers, but look at the PNN 50 number down there, 77.2%. The top of the scale in that study was 60. So this is off the chart by every measure. And all we did was meditation, kundalini style. It turns out that HRV actually can be used to track uh, the progression of diseases. Cancer and HRV, it turns out that cancer, solid tumor cancers, all attach themselves to the sympathetic nervous system. They hijack that to grow. And you can pick up signals. Uh, the curves on the left correspond to people whose SDNN is less than 20, and the ones on the right, those uh, that are greater than 20 milliseconds. And you see these biomarkers, which are much more expensive uh, to do, that it tracks. Let me quickly tell you about this interesting story. You know, there's a problem of premature births. The human uterus, uh, the mother's uterus, is designed to not contract prematurely. And then a few weeks before the child is due, a switch flips, you see these two curves. There are biomarkers, the corticotrophin-releasing hormone and a binding protein. Uh, in the beginning, it's configured in a way that prevents contractions, and then later on it switches and you have contractions. That crossover takes place three weeks before birth, even in a premature delivery situation. You can't afford to be doing these biomarkers on everybody every day, but you can do HRV. If you look at the HRV curves at the bottom, you can see that switch take place. So you would have three weeks' notice. So we've been working with a patient who has PTSD and asking him to keep notes so that we can tell if there are autonomic nervous system disorders. Uh, again, the curves here, if you look at the blue one, it maxes out at 80 years. This is the most stressed state you can possibly be in using this formula. This gentleman is always in that state, except one day when it dipped. If you look on the top over there, at 7.45 in the morning, he kept notes. His reaction is he coughs, gags, falls down, passes out. That actually is relief for him. And then he goes back into this stressed state and stays there for the next 14 hours. Uh, people with PTSD who suffer from this cannot drive. They're not allowed to drive because this can happen in the middle of a driving incident because it's a trigger event. We can find measures here. Let me wrap up uh, with just this one tantalizing possibility. Ebola is a big concern globally. What do they really do right now to screen for Ebola? They take your body temperature in a large public health context, right? That's all they do. But here's the study. Mittal and others at the All India Institute of Medical Science published this a few years ago. They looked at a bunch of HIV-positive individuals who had not developed AIDS, who showed no signs of AIDS. So this is not a study about Ebola. It is a study about HIV. Look at the difference between the curves you see for the control subjects and the HIV positives, right? Your body knows, your autonomic nervous system knows that you've been exposed to HIV and it is trying to fight it, trying to adapt to it. A sixth grader can tell the difference between these two curves. We could all be wearing heart rate monitors that will give us that sense of confidence that even though we might be going through spaces where you could be getting infected, that you aren't. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you can actually entangle with other meditators, so there's a reason why you practice together. It turns out that you can relate these effects uh, at deeper and deeper levels. The different kriyas, you know, it's a combination of hand gestures, breathing, asanas, and chants, actually pro produce different effects on you. Just like not all pills are the same, not all kriyas are the same, and they affect you in new ways. So let me summarize by pointing out, we have a sensor network in us. 
Most of us are alienated from it. We don't know what it's telling us because we've tuned out. You can use technology to tune back in. So you pull those signals and amplify it. But after you do all the sensing, you've got to do something to change. And I think going back to old India, and maybe around the world too, gives you practices that can, you can measurably determine what difference does it make to you. Thank you.